But is it on for Cigar Federation, too? We're on Cigar Federation, yeah. Okay, good. And we're live. What embargo? Book 2, Chapter 5, and we are spending an evening with a good friend of mine, Jose Blanco, and it's it's a bold endeavor for, for Jose to be a manufacturer to, to come on a show and and you know talk about talk about Cubans. But then again, if, if you know Jose, you know he smokes anything and everything, um, and he appreciates all good cigars no matter where they're from. Um, That's right. Which means that there's some bad Cubans, and I'll agree with him on that one, just as yeah. there are some bad Nicaraguans. But um, Jose, why don't we? What are you smoking right now? Why don't we tell the well, audience what you're? To be honest, you know, it's uh, first of all, it's uh, good evening, uh, everybody, uh, and uh, great to be on on, on the show. What embargo? And of course, uh, anything that has to do with the uh, Cigar Federation. Uh, everybody, knows I'm a big fan of. Uh, any cigar that's good. I smoke four or five cigars a day. Uh, it's different. I can't smoke the same cigar back to back unless I'm working on something in the factory. It'll be the first cigar of the day if it's a blend I'm working, and then it'll be the first cigar in the afternoon if I have to smoke two cigars in the day. But actually, I do four to five. It's different. It doesn't matter. Basically, Dominican cigars, some Cubans, some cigars from Nicaragua, once in a while, something. From Honduras, but I'm very open-minded and uh, always looking forward to uh, just talk about cigars. And uh, you know, even though uh, I have to say this, Cuban cigar lovers, I think, are the most uh, uh, hardcore uh, defenders of Cuban cigars in the world. And like I've said, that uh, of course, Cuba makes great cigars, and I think that uh, one day. Uh, when this mess is all fixed up, uh, we will even see uh, much better cigars. It's uh, right now. It's uh, it's like a catch twenty two situation. It's you know I'll agree with you. I'll tell you one thing because you know I I love Cubans. I do a show on it, and yeah, I, you know I find myself defending Cubans quite a bit. Uh, June, I'm sure you do as well. Um, yes, nay. Yeah, I mean I. I personally enjoy cigars that got a good balance of everything. Um, I feel like Cubans have that. I feel like non-Cuban stuff has, but when I smoked cigars back in what, like six, seven years ago, um, you know, Nicaraguan cigars didn't taste the same as it did now, in my opinion. Um, or it was just the market dictated that it's just a lot of powerful, spicy stuff, which is just powerful and spicy just for the heck of it. Um, I'm not a fan of those cigars, but when I switched over and smoked some for the first time, uh, I really got a good sense of you know balance and complexity and depth and just you know that's what I enjoy about it overall. I think that I mean, non-Cubans make crap cigars, great cigars. So does Cubans, right? So um, yeah, yeah. I mean, anyone who smoked a uh... Gosh, a K Dorsey knows that it's a crap cigar. Uh, no, please. <laughs> Which one? K Dorsey. I like him. I don't know why. <laughs> so, but um, you Jose, know, I oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, I I, I first wanted to uh, kind of spend the session and picking Jose's brain on you know his love for cigars and just specifically talking about Cuban cigars. Uh, so, Jose, what what do you think about just kind of, you know, I know that you've been smoking for way longer than I have, certainly most people out there. Um, so how do you feel about, you know, people talk about Cuban cigars tasting different back in the day versus now. Um, what are your thoughts on how Cuban cigars were smoking back in the day and how current production is like? Look, this is, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of people talking about Cuban cigars, and unfortunately in the United States and many parts of the world, uh, people smoke a lot of fake cigars. And, you know, when I'm at an event and somebody comes up and tells me, well, you know, I just got this box of Monty 2s for 275 what do you think of it? First thing I tell them, well, you got screwed because they cost like 450 475 in Cuba. So the, you have a lot of uh, people out there that are selling uh, fake cigars, and I think that's one of the biggest things we're going to face when the embargo is lifted. But that aside, you know, you got to go back in time. You know, I started smoking Cuban cigars probably 
I've been smoking for 48 years, so that was probably when I was 22, 23, once in a while, and then when I was, I would say 24, 25, maybe a little bit more, I started, people would travel to Cuba, bring me cigars. I got some cigars from some people living here that had good contacts and would get them. And to be honest, you know, the consistency, the draw, you could, you could pick up the aging of the tobacco was totally different. Now, what people don't know is that Cuba had her, when, when, when we started with the boom, that the boom was 93 on, Cuba, I think, it was 1992, was hit for the first time with blue mold. Then I think it got hit with flooding in 93, and I think it got hit with blue mold in 94. So what happens? Four or five years of inventory all of a sudden got swept away, plus the demand because of the boom. you got to remember, like in 19, I think it was 98 or 99 to 2000, Habanos, uh, had a production, tried to do a production of over 200 million cigars a year, but we all know that a lot of those cigars went back. You would look like a box of Monte Fours, and you could see 13 across. You would see uh, brown. You would see uh, uh, almost greenish. You would see like you couldn't match two <laughs> wrappers together in those times, 2002, 2000, uh, 99, 2000. 2001, and then they realized they had to bring down production. Also, you have to understand that uh, while in the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, and Honduras, we have all this technology uh, and we have all this equipment to work the land, like you still go to Cuba and you still see oxes, like a lot of places in San Juan and Martinez and Vuelta Arriba y, y Vuelta Abajo, still with that, while I think very rarely in this country you'll see a, a lot, you'll see tractors, and you'll see all these uh, mo modern things. But that, pull, uh, you know, putting that aside, you have to look at cigars, I would say, before 1995 and then after that. Now, they've had some good years, and I think in the last two or three years, their limited editions and some of their regionals have gotten much better, in my personal opinion. Now, their regular production still, there's a lot of inconsistency on it, uh, hard draw, uh, cigars that you know the tobacco, it needs time. You know, tobacco's from, you hear people, especially, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, England. The English are the greatest defenders of Cuban tobacco in the world. I don't think there's any country in the world, <laughs> but it has a lot, a lot to do with with business. So when, some, when somebody in England, and I have a lot of good friends in England, especially one of my best friends is Mitchell Orch, and he's, he's, he's one of the biggest retailers of Cuban tobaccos in the world. They tell me, well, Cuba makes the best cigars. And I tell them, look, it's, it's, that's not true. Is a, is a Cuban cigar good? It's as good as a cigar is going to get, but it's different. It doesn't mean it's better. It's just a different profile from Dominican Republic, from Honduras, from Nicaragua, from Costa Rica, from Mexico. It's like when I laugh when people tell me that the, t the, the two tobaccos that are more similar is Cuba and Nicaragua. And then I tell people who say that, then you have never, ever smoked a real Cuban cigar. Because the creaminess of Cuban tobacco could only be compared with the creaminess of Piloto Cubano in Corojo 98 and some corojos that are grown there. If you take pure grade tobaccos from Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua, Nicaragua doesn't have any similarities. But that doesn't mean the tobaccos from Nicaragua are, I'm not saying they're bad, they're good, because many of my blends that I've done during years have tobacco from uh, Nicaragua. My senoria has tobacco from Nicaragua. Emma uses uh, 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 tobacco from Nicaragua. Hochi, my cousin, used tobacco from Nicaragua. So it's it's just this mindset that people have uh, about it, and it's totally different. Cuba and, and, and Dominican Republic are more similar than Cuba and Nicaragua. Yeah, Nicaragua, Nicaragua is very, very, nothing like Cuban tobacco. I got also tobacco, but uh, it's nothing like Cuban tobacco. I think, I think Honduran tobacco from like Hamastron and even as you said, you know, Piloto Cubano from the DR are much more in line um, with, with Cuban tobacco. 
So I'd agree with you on that one. Um, I have another question. I'm just going to kind of throw out questions of because I feel like part of what's great about what you do is you you know tobacco really well. Um, a lot of people view you as that guy that knows tobacco. So I've been within the what like last eight nine years of smoking or so. Um, you know, I have questions that just never made any sense to me uh, while I smoke it. Like, for instance, like, you know, the majority of us know that uh, overall Cuban cigars are better aged, right? Like, that's a blanket statement a lot of people say. Um, can you talk about that and your experience of, you know, why that is as compared to, like, non-Cuban market? Usually, you know, when it comes out, it's ready to smoke and it's delicious. Well, the first thing I understand is that while... Uh in Dominican Republic and many other company, uh, the majority of companies in Dominican Republic have inventory of three, four, five years. There's some companies here that have tobaccos that are 10, 12, even 20 years old. Yeah. In Nicaragua, we have two or three companies that really age your tobaccos also. But the problem in Cuba is that Cuba only has three sources of income. It's tobacco, sugar, and tourism. So while we're aging tobacco three, four, five years in Cuba, and I don't care what they say, their regular production, that tobacco is not more than a year, year and a half. Now, of the Edición Limitadas, I firmly believe there are some tobaccos that are two or three years old. But to come out to tell me there's tobacco they're using it for 10 years, it's not true. Because what, what, what people don't realize, the problem with Cuba is not filler and it's not binder. The problem with Cuba is they have a lack of wrapper. Right now, the last year, Cuba can only make 90 million cigars. And their production is going to be less and less and less. Why? Uh, they lost 5,000 curing barns, I think it was like three or four years ago, that the government had to make a decision. What do we do? Do we make curing barns or do we help uh, put roofs on, on you know, the people in the countryside of that? So they had to involve that, put roofs, repair houses, make curing barns. You know, oh. I've, said, I've said this a million times, and I'm going to say it again tonight. We will see the greatness of Cuban tobaccos again not when the embargo is lifted. That will not change anything. Democracy has to come back. Uh, Castro and the regime has to leave. Castro has to come in, and it will take a minimum, a minimum of six to seven years before things get in Cuba the way they were before. Yeah. Maybe more. It's inter you know, it's interesting because when you talk about filler and binder, and, and I'll admit it, is there's a uh, La Casa del Habano in I think the Netherlands or something, or Germany, I can't remember, June knows, that was making a, uh, a custom for the... Oh, yeah. Their it's, shop, a... And it's a blend of Nicaraguan and, and Cuban tobacco. And, you know, June and I asked the question, I wonder what the wrapper is, and we wanted, you know, we preferred a wrapper that was from Cuba, but... Do you think that just Cuban tobacco, and I've smoked Cuban tobacco and blends, do you think it does better with a wrapper that is not from Cuba? And the reason for that is just because the better quality wrapper that, that we can that we can get out of the DR, or Ecuador, or Nicaragua, et cetera? Listen, uh, you know, there's a lot of people. I'm not, I don't have to defend Cuba because I don't get anything out of it. But every time that I hear people saying that tobacco's from uh, back in the old days, it was the Cuba was getting tobacco from us. And it was now the last three or four people saying that, you know, they're getting wrappers from Ecuador and tobaccos from Nicaragua. And then I tell them, if you have been smoking Cuban cigars and you have smoked non-Cuban cigars, and let's say 30% or 25% of the filler in that cigar is Nicaragua, the cigar will taste totally different. And you and I have had this conversation because uh, I told you that when I used to go to Cuba, Rowena would always give me uh, 300 or 400 leaves of, of wrapper. And I would bring it to La Aurora and I would fool around with it. And my good friend Trey Samet uh, in, in Canada, uh, one time I went there, it was like maybe four or five years ago, and he had about eight or ten pounds of Cuban Lijero, uh of filler there, and he had, I don't know, maybe two or three pounds of binder. I'm not doing anything with this. The Cubans left it here. I have it in perfect condition. And I brought it back. And, you know, once in a while, people will take, will, they will go to Cuba, would, you know, I would tell them who to go to, and I would always get two or three pounds of tobacco. So I've made blends 
with Cuban wrappers, a Dominican binder, 30% Cuban, 25% Nicaragua, some nice Corojo and Piloto uh, Cubano cigars. And, and I've given them to people that really, really smoke. And there's, there's a person that doesn't work with cigar aficionado anymore, James Suckling, that even wrote a blog about it. And uh, at a show in Vegas, I think it was like 2007, 2008, uh, they do a pre-show, a pre-dinner, and I arrived early, and James said, do you have anything to smoke? And I gave him this uh, Corona cigar that I've been playing with, and right away, four or five months into it, he says, this is not totally Cuban. This is really good, and it has some Cuban tobacco in it. Then I explained to him, but I told him, look, if you're going to write about it, just don't mention that it was me who did it. And he wrote a, a, a nice blog, and he wrote that it was very interesting. I think tobaccos uh, from Nicaragua, uh, especially Nicaragua, Dominican, and Cuba, they marinate very, very well. But to go out, like a lot of people have said, that uh, the Cubans are using uh, tobaccos from other countries. Look, I've been in many factories there. And I mean, when I went there the first time, uh, I was allowed to go everywhere. And I can tell you, I did not see a leaf of tobacco not from Cuba. Yeah. I mean, you always hear those things, and it's it's you know I'm like you. It's I, I I would love to 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 be able to have that opportunity one day to to work with with Cuban tobacco and you know some Aganorsa and some some you know some of Christian's Coro from Honduras and some DR tobacco. I just think it'd be a lot of fun, um, you know, Ecuadorian tobacco as well. It's just that'd be pretty sweet in my opinion. Well, if you look at it, you know, people ask me all the time, what country do you think that's producing the best rappers in the world right now? In my opinion, it's uh, to me, I think it's Ecuador by far. I mean, yeah. you have Cabano, you have Sumatra, you have the Connecticut. Uh, some people are growing uh, Piloto Cubano, some people are growing Criollo 98. I mean, the, the land, the soil, everything in, 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 in Ecuador, I mean, it's like God just, or Mother Nature just said, like, if you guys are going to be like the next generation or the big, the, not the generation, but the next big tobacco uh, uh, producing country for rappers. The rappers from from uh, from Ecuador are amazing. It's not only the Perez family, the Oliva family, you have Fermin is a Dominican that's been working a lot. You have also uh, uh, the Perez family, which are the biggest growers of Connecticut rapper in the world. You have also the people from La Aurora with Fermin, they're growing tobacco there. The guy from uh, uh, Roberto Duran, he a friend of mine that was here this week, uh, Tomas Cabrera, he's a very famous agronomist from uh, from Cuba working there. You have uh, the Cubans that own Vitola's Bar, Gustavo and his brother, they're, they're growing tobacco there with our good friend Freddy. So, you know, there's a lot. Damien Bouchoff out of uh, of uh, the French guy who has uh, the big tobacco uh, warehouses here in in, in uh, Sona Franca. He grew last year. I think it was 850,000 pounds of wrapper. So it's uh, wow. Ecuador. I mean, it's it's just amazing the tobacco that's coming out of there. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Ecuador and Sumatra. I love I love when it's a really in Havana too. Yeah. I'm still waiting for you to do an Ecuador and Sumatra release. <laughs> We're working on some things. I know. June. Um, oh, I know what to ask you. So Seth and I had, I'm not sure if you had the cigar, Jose, but we had the uh, the Boulevard uh, Limited Edition for, our, was that 2014? They called it the Super Corona, right? <laughs> uh yeah. Him and I talked about this. I don't know if you guys had this discussion already, but um, we smoked that when the cigar first came out, and we thought they were pretty good cigars. So we smoked that uh, four or five months later, and man, it tasted like, to me, it tasted like dirty ashtray. <laughs> it was it was not good. Uh, what happened? Why, why does that happen? Look, to be honest, in my experience with this, it should have tasted much better. Yeah, my opinion. Look, you, you, look. It's a hand rolled product. You can never know. I'm gonna give you an example uh, of something that happened to me. I can't remember if it was 2009 or 2010. Could have been maybe 2010. 
Monte Cristo and Mundo came out. Okay. In 2010. Maybe it was the Petit and Mundo. I can't remember. Either way, well, I know what but, you... but before Petit and Mundo, the Big and Mundo came out. Well, yeah. Uh, a friend from Havana sent me a box, and I opened up the box. I smoked the cigar, and it was terrible. <laughs> but that's no. To be honest, I uh, and I've told this story a million times. I put it away for a year. Not a year and two days, not 360 days, exactly a year. The year was completed on a Sunday morning. So I had it in my phone, smoke uh, in Mundo. So it was early Sunday morning, maybe 7, 7.30 in the morning. I, had I love a, that you have oh, an alert. I'm going to interrupt you here. I love that you have an alert on your phone. <laughs> The smoke that Monica said moved up. That's just I should start awesome. doing that. That's just, yeah. that's just incredible. Right? No, I didn't know because I was curious. So what happened? I go to my humidor. I uh, took out the cigar. I cut it. Thank God it had a good draw. And it was like smoking two totally different cigars. Yeah. That year of aging brought out the creaminess. It brought out the flavors. It brought out all the richness that that cigar had. So a year did a ton. And then, you know, a year later, two years later, I think I might still have two or three of them left. They were, they were good. And uh, at time, and, and, and to be honest, June, I don't, I don't know why, because my experience with Cubans has always been that after a year, two years, three years, I mean, they just get much yeah, and and I and I feel like that doesn't happen in the non-Cuban cigars I've had, right? Like non-Cuban cigars, when I first get them, I mean, probably ninety-nine percent of them are smokable and you know, they're good. Uh, and as age goes on, you know, I lose out on things like strength, right? Which makes sense. The nicotine kind of goes away after a couple years or a few years or whatnot. But I've never had, I guess, what you call a Cuban cigar is a sick period. Some people call them. Um, yeah. Well, the, so. the sick period, you have to understand, it's a, the sick period is when the cigar, see, there's a lot of confusion over that. The sick period is really after the cigar is made, those four, five, six, seven, eight days after that, they're going into the sick, the sick period. That's why when you make a cigar or you smoke it right off the table or you just let it rest for 21 days. Now, this that happen with Cuban cigars, sometimes it's tobacco that maybe on regular production doesn't have a year and it needs that extra, extra, extra aging on it mm. to get better. That's what happens with the majority of uh, Cuban cigars on regular production. Yeah. Oh. Uh, just the, the tobacco is too young. It's it's young. That's the truth. And you know these people that defend it. They, look, the first thing I tell people: you buy a box of Cubans. If you can read the codes, and you see it's a cigar that's from this year. Smoke one, make notes out of it, put it away for a year. And also, I always tell people who travel abroad, especially in Spain, France, that try to go after the ones that don't. People go after Coiva, Monte Cristo, Romeo. Go after Sancho Panza, Trinidad, uh, uh, sometimes A. Chapman, and try to see those boxes that have been sitting there that are there from uh, 12, from 11, from 13, and you're going to see that those cigars are ready to smoke right away. They already have two or three years of aging on them. Yeah, that's a nice thing when you buy Poro Laranagas. You can usually get a box with a lot of age on it. And it's because it's, you know, I bought a box of uh, a Boulevard uh, Petit Coronas probably in 2000, 2009 that were, that were pretty young. Um, and they were rough. They were, they were really not good. Um, but, man, they're smoking amazing now. The, the petite coronas are just fantastic and it's just it's something that needs age but it's just you're right it's just that that young tobacco which you know i mean you age your cigars 180 days after rolling and then yes. they, and they ship out oh. but it's um you know you can you pick those up and they're they're great but i mean the 65s are still smoking i like actually how the 65s are now they're a little bit softer <laughs> 
Well, those, that, you know, the tobacco on that, the average on that is more or less six years. The wrapper is actually seven. Some other fillers are five years. But I'll give you an example of a, and this is something you probably see on Instagram. Every time I see somebody smoking a Trinidad, whether I know them or not, I always put a like and this comment on it. That's one of the most underrated Cuban cigars there is. I love Trinidad. It's phenomenal cigar. It doesn't have the name as Coiva or Monty or A. Chapman or Monte Cristo. But I've had so much good luck, especially with uh, uh, Trinidad, uh, Coloniales, and I think Fundadores. Yeah. That cigar is phenomenal. I think you and I talked that on my trip to China, I met this uh, very wealthy uh, guy, and he gave me original Coiba, a single six. He gave me St. Louis Ray from, I think, five from 2001. He also gave me, and I found uh, with my friend Edward Wang a a shop where actually the guy knew who I was. He was flattered that I was there. It was like a little shithole in, in Hong Kong. <laughs> And a great price on uh, Trinidad. It was like a, it's it's not a Lancero. It's 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 a Trinidad. I would say it's like maybe a six and a half by maybe forty two. I might have a couple of left. That's about the fundador. The fundadores. I don't know what it was to be honest, but it was like a six and a half maybe by forty two or forty. Wow. It's not, but it was a limited edition two thousand seven. Oh, the, yeah, the limited, yeah, that was something oh. I of. Yeah. Yeah, it's on my Instagram somewhere. That cigar is one of the best cigars that I've had. Now, I know this question is going to pop up. What is the best cigar that I smoked in the last 10 years, Cuban, or maybe 15? Cardigas de Reserva, the one that had the black oh. and silver band on it. That is probably... One of my most memorable smokes of all times. When did you smoke that, roughly? Oh, shit. I smoked that maybe five or six years ago. Okay. So when did those came out? Those came out, oh, man. Seven? I think oh, like 2004 or 2005, maybe. maybe yeah. Later. That might be even later. Yeah. Nice. I don't know, man. You can't, can't beat Jose, Jose Piedras. Then the other most memorable Cuban smoke I've had, I was visiting my friend Trey Samet, that we had been friends for years, and he had been in Dominican Republic. So I went, when I went to Canada for the first time on business, the year 2000, and I remember it was April or May, and I told Trey, because uh, at that time I was working with La Aurora, that I was going to visit. He says, I have something special for you. So at that time, you could smoke in the shops, and he had a nice lounge downstairs, and he went into this room he has. Everything is, like, sealed with all the alarms in the world, and he's a big collector. So he said he brought out a box of Romeo and Julieta, Petit Bellicoso, 1990. Oh, wow. I've, I've never, ever nubbed the cigar the way I nubbed that cigar. Wow. It was... It was what I call a memorable smoke. But it was 1990. I had 10 years on it. Yeah, that's, that's a good amount of time. Now, speaking of memorable Cubans, we're going to go instead of positive, negative. Should Habanos and Cuba Tobacco just stop making the Cohiba Enduro 5s? Well, I mean, why, why is it that... I mean, I have my theories, but, you know, you have... And I'm going to use... Cinderella Maduro, um, the Matilde Oscura. I, I know that's Mexican San Andreas, but those are two fantastic Maduro offerings. It really captures what I think Maduros are all about. But, but Cuba just can't seem to get it. They just keep failing miserably off of this. Listen, I have still maybe three or four original, because they were given to me. Actually, that's when they started packing them in 2006. I remember it was... Magico, Secreto, and Enios, I think, were the, the three ones they made. And I remember that Débora Garcia at Partagas, uh, they were sorting them for the first shipment. And the first thing she asked me, what do you think the American consumer is going to think about that? And I said, it's great that you guys are coming out with it, because unfortunately in the many parts of the world, if a, if a wrapper is not very, very dark, 
people don't think it's Maduro because in the mind of people, people think that Maduro, the color, is what determines whether it's Maduro or not. It's not true. So I remember I smoked them there. I didn't like them. And then somebody gave me, I can't remember who it was, a box of the 2008 or 2009 festival, and it had a Coiba Maduro in it. And it was horrible. Yeah. And then during, as years gone, gone by, people have given them to me, and people bring presents, and I still can't smoke that cigar. I don't know what it is. It's very unbalanced. It's it's not earthy. It's muddy, and it just leaves me with with that I just don't like. I just don't like that that coiba, that coiba maduro. It, it doesn't do it. It's, well, to be honest, it's not my cup of tea. There's people that rave about it, but it's not my cup of tea. Yeah, well, those people are wrong. So I feel like the only way I've only heard of people talking about the coiba maduro in a good light is when. It's you know guys that strict smoke strictly Cuban cigars, and they turn to something like the Cohiba Maduro as a way to break up their routine, so-called. Uh, which I don't agree with. I mean, first of all, if you only smoke Cuban cigars, you're really missing out on cigars in general. Uh, you're missing the boat. Yeah, you're missing yeah. a lot of stuff. So those are typically the older school guys where you know they're like, oh, I've been smoking for 50 years. Cuba is where it's at. Blah blah blah. But yeah. But other than that, nobody buys them. That's why you still see those materials. You know, there's still original release boxes out there at a fair price. So oh, yeah. <laughs> can't get rid of them. I so, know. Right. You know, it, I love to talk. It doesn't matter what part of the world I'm in. If, if I'm in Sweden, in France, in Spain, in Mexico, Argentina, China, Thailand, I love to talk cigars. But if somebody, the conversation is only going to be about Cuban, it's going to be a very short conversation. Because I like people to be open-minded. Yeah. And for me, a guy, I love pizza and steak, but I can't have it every day. So my definition of that is they're very good, but they're not better. They're just totally different because the taste profile of Cuban cigars is totally different from DR, from Nicaragua, from Mexico, from Ecuador, from Costa Rica, from Honduras. Uh, from Peru, it's just a totally different profile. Now, you have tobaccos like a Piloto Cubano grown here, like what Hochi and Lito do, that you smoke a cigar and you will pick up what I consider Cubanesque notes. And that used to happen a lot also with the original Camacho Coro. And I always told Christian that, that it has Cubanesque notes. Now, people ask me all the time, what tastes like a Cuban? You know what my response is? Another Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> Good response. <laughs> well, it's, and it's, it's so true because I could not, I mean, I love, I, I love a lot of cigars from all over the place, but I couldn't just smoke Cubans. I, I, I think that's what makes it great is that, you know, the ability to, you know, I'm going to smoke uh, a Davidoff, and then, you know, I can smoke a... a it, something from Agonorsa, and then something from mm. Cuba, and then something, you know, uh, from one of yours, a, a Tabacara Palma, one of the Blancos uh, releases, and it's just, there's a nice variety. Everything's a little bit different. Um, it's just fun. It's entertaining. It, it, you're getting new experiences and something different all the time. Um, I mean, I've been a little disappointed with a lot of recent Nicaraguan stuff besides Agonorsa. I think Agonorsa stuff's good, but the, the stuff coming out of the DR right now, I'm just really really a fan of. I think there's a lot of creativity on the island. Speaking of uh, just kind of different tobaccos and whatnot, Jose, within the cigars that you blend, uh, that you ultimately come out with in production, um, what is the inspiration behind that? Is it you try to make what the market is dictating? You try to you know make stuff that you can smoke the rest of your life? Uh, can you... I just want to personally know. <laughs> No, l listen, I, I've had this conversation many times with uh, on many programs that I've been on. You have to look at the trend sometimes, maybe in sizes, because, you know, uh, I'm, M and I are very traditional. And uh, the first thing, uh, I never tried to make anything not even close to anything that's in the market, and especially I will never do anything 
like anything I uh, I've done previous years in La Aurora or that I did it at Hoya de Nicaragua, because those things are already made. You have to be very creative. So what do you look at? You look at different tobaccos. You look at the amount of tobaccos that you have. You look at the aging of the tobacco that you have. You look at the profile of what you want to make. It's like when we were working on Senor Now, the people we had on the panel, the first thing we would ask them is because there were people that already had been smoking and, and knew of my career for many years, is it, is it similar to anything we've made or that I've made? And they said absolutely not. And uh, with the Senorial uh, Maduro, it was, you know, we just didn't want to, like, what a lot of people do is they have a blend that's been good, and what they do is they just slap a, uh, a wrapper on it. We don't, we don't do those things, you know. We, we worked on it. We had a, the basics on it to, to make it. I'll give you an example also with Freya. That, that was something that Emma did on her own. She worked, uh, it, it, you know, I didn't have to do anything with it. Hochi, my cousin, didn't have to do she had her ideas. She went to the production manager. She said, I want uh, a Mexican binder. I want this uh, wrapper. I want these fillers and all that. And she worked her blend. And then we were uh, the panel for her, uh, which, by the way, it's, it's doing very great. It's, it's a great cigar. It's, it's a lot of flavor. It's, it's very unique, has a great concept, and she's worked very hard on it. But it's like when I go to the show, and I always bring back 150, 200 uh, samples that people give me, and, and probably a lot, a lot of the people that start off, well, they come up to me, oh, Mr. Blanco, we know that you smoke everything, you smoke these cigars, and, and when you when you have time, let me know what you what you think about it, and I ask them, well, what are you uh, looking for? Well, uh, this cigar tastes like so-and-so cigars and so-and-so. I don't say anything to them, but in my mind, I would say, well, why are you telling me you're making a cigar to compete with this guy, with that guy, when already these guys are successful? And you want to sell a $14 cigar where these people have already been successful with a $10 cigar. So I don't say anything to them, but through my mind, I go like, what are they thinking? So to answer your question, we will never, ever, Emma and I, make anything that's similar uh, to anything that's in the market or that I've made before because that's not being creative. Yeah. yeah I was, uh, that's interesting you say that because... Um, one of my favorite cigars, I think this is when you were back at La Aurora, uh, I had this like 100 Anos, I think it was like a little Petite, it was, I think it was a Petite Lancero no, that somebody I, gifted me. <coughs> How many years ago? Oh, this is a long time ago. So um, that's the original one, that cigar is phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I afterwards I smoked that, I talked to my buddy, it was actually Dustin, uh, and I said... I need a half more. He says, "Sorry, buddy, that's that's long ago." I was like, "So, <laughs> no." Um, Jose, uh, well, think Cuba. So, like within market trends, um, so Cuba they produce a lot of regionals and the Reserva line, Limitada line, and then the Grand Reserva line. Uh, do you see that kind of parlaying over to the non-Cuban field and and working well on that? Because I. You know, I still see I see some of that. I mean, I know, like for instance, uh, like John Huber does store exclusive. Pete Johnson definitely does store exclusives. Um, do you see that kind of trend continuing and selling hot over here? It's doing well. The, the thing with the limited, there's a whole bunch of people that don't that are totally against it. First of all, because they don't get it. it. It's hard for you to find a cigar you really like and not be able to to smoke it again. But the, it's a limited edition, so if you really like it, you know, maybe you can, because it, it's it's like a catch-22 because, you know, okay, I don't have the money. I could only buy two. I wish I could buy two boxes. So, you know, the guys that really have the money, they'll go and buy two or three boxes and have it. For the regular guy, yeah, maybe he could spend $100. Maybe he can go and buy 10 cigars and that's it. So it's sometimes it's a financial situation, but I'll give you an example. 20,000 cigars for the... Uh, for the 65th anniversary, and I think we have maybe a hundred something boxes left in the uh, in the office. We don't even push it anymore. What we're not going to do is like three years later come up and say, "Well, we still have 65th anniversary time deal." Maybe it'll run through the first quarter of next year, but when it's gone, it's gone because it's that's it. I mean, we've left something uh, for for 
our other markets in, in Asia and also in Sweden and in, in Russia and in Macedonia, Greece and things like that. But it's not like three or four years later, you know, we're going to come up with it like some people have done. No, no, when it, it's done, it's done. The cigars were made and just sitting there. Mm. We don't have the even even if let's say it would be the cigar of the year this year and we would need 100,000 cigars, we couldn't make it because it was a limited edition. It was limited to 20, 21,000 cigars because it was a small, especially the wrapper, we didn't have more tobacco to make it. So I'm not going to, after putting a seven-year-old wrapper, come up and put something on a three-year-old wrapper. It could be very similar, but it's not going to be the same. So I'm not going to put my name and my, my, my reputation down the line because I want to make a couple of dollars. Mm. Great cigar. I love that stick. Uh, a 60 bit. Oh, yeah. I did you a... smoke it? June, did you smoke it? No, not yet. Um, oh. I actually knew about you within that 100 annals. So when I smoked that 100 annals that you had uh, taken back in the day, uh, that's how I knew about you and just like I smoked everything else that you made. Um, I, I I haven't had a Maduro Senor Real yet, uh, but um, yeah, I will. Okay. So I'll do it by make get, little B and M I'll trips. Get, I'll, get, I'll get you taken care of. I'll send you some stuff. Oh, cool. Thanks. Um, Seth, I just had a curiosity. What is your favorite? What we were talking about like the best cigar we had within the last whatever few years. What's yours? I actually smoked mine like literally a month ago. You know, it's. It's it's funny. Uh, the first time I smoked that in Mundo Dante's 109. That's I'll never forget that experience. But I just smoked a um, a 2008 regional. Um, I smoked it again. It was just fantastic. Um, it was a Ramon Iones for uh, the Belgium region. And it oh, was a, uh, the Benelux regional yeah, one. 2008. It was like a robusto extra. I mean, it was um, yeah. just so flavorful. Really good Ramon Iones. Um, yeah. It's just, I mean, it's it's gone, but it's one of those I really like that. Um, that's that's pretty darn memorable. I mean, I love H. Upman Sir Winston's, and uh, you know, it's which, which would which would bring on our next conversation. But what's what's your favorite Cuban in a while, Jude? Um, so I was skeptical about I, I'm skeptical about Cuban custom rolls in general. Uh, but at my local B&M about four years ago, I gave this guy literally like bags of cigars because I just had so much of it, and he had he was complaining about poker buddies that always want to take his dab it off and whatever he wants to covet. Um, so as a result, when he came the next day, he gave me this real fat cigar, uh, and he told me that that was actually a uh, Alejandro Robina uh, farm roll. It's a big cigar. It's got like close foot and everything, and it's got a real nice hearty wrapper, which I rarely see out of Cuba. Not certainly back in those days. Um, and he said it was a 2002. I smoked that. Oh my gosh! I think I burned that so much that I burned my fingers, and I wasn't cognizant of it, and I kept smoking it. <laughs> it was awesome. But then again, can't get him. I know, you know what Seth and I talked about, I think I'm going to have two left, is the Monte Cristo that was made for La Casa de la Mano in Mexico, the 109. Yeah. Yeah. That cigar to me, is a, it was a memorable smoke too. That's, that's I, don't think, I don't think there's many of those around anymore. Hmm. Yeah, they're, I mean, if they are around, you're paying, you're paying a lot of premium books on it. So... so when I think of Cuba, and I compare it with other countries, double Coronas and Churchills really come to mind. And there's not many non-Cuban manufacturers that take on the double Corona. And I don't think a lot of them take on the Churchill. Jose, why why wouldn't people take it? Because I mean, you smoke. Do you? Th I think Cuba makes great double Coronas, and maybe I just think they make great double Coronas because not many other people take it on. You know, you never made a double Corona. Well, you're talking about a double Corona seven and a half by fifty, right? Yeah, seven and a half forty nine, seven and a half fifty. Yeah. Yeah. 
because you know under you know in, in the states uh, you know Churchill's a whole bunch of things, but under Cuban standard, a Churchill is really seven by forty-seven. Yeah. There's people who do it by 48, by 49. I've even seen Churchill's people say 7 by 52. Yeah, which is huge. But, well, it's, it's, you know how it is. We've, we've made up so many different uh, uh, names and sizes and things like that, which I think it's interesting. But I don't, I don't see, I've been seeing for years, I would say probably, especially in the U.S. market in the last 10 years, I don't think there's many really uh, double Coronas out there. Yeah. People just don't take it on. Why is that? Yeah. I remember La Rosa have a double Corona. And I remember we, that. Uh, that we didn't Cameroon. sell a lot of it. Huh? It was a Cameroon, wasn't it? Yep. Cameroon, double Corona. I like that. But I know, but it was never, it was, it's never a big seller. But then you see people in the States smoking a 7 by 80 yeah, that's a petite that's a petite corona, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I what I've seen in the last year, maybe a year and a couple of months, even though the big cigars are still selling a lot, but I've seen a lot of people that have gone I see their posts, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at the events when I visit. Uh Going down a bit. I was at an event at, uh, it was in Alabama, and I had been there the year before, and we sold about 30 or 35 boxes at an event. And these two guys, I remember, were the first two that arrived at the event, and that was when we were doing our first year of Senoria, and the first two boxes I signed for them was two boxes of 6 by 60 which I was very happy. But this year they came in each box, and they bought uh, six by fifty-four. And I said, "Wow, I remember you guys. What happened?" <laughs> I said, well, you know, after the smell, we've, we've got we still like our big cigars, but we're more now into robustos and Corona Gordas. So, and we do like the uh, the Senorita line. So what we did is just, you know, we took a little bit off it and uh, we're buying a couple of boxes of the Toro Bravo six by fifty-four. But uh, we see ourselves in the future going down more to 52s, 54, 46s, and and even some lanceros. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it's. But you know, and the other, another, a smaller size that that I'm gonna kind of credit you kind of bringing back was the Lonsdale, and I think he brought it when when he did this the uh, CYB Lonsdale extra. Uh huh. And then you're doing it again with Senor Maduro, and I love the Lonsdale offering. Um, and that's that's another Vitola offering that's not really big in the states. I know, I know, I know. I remember that a couple of people said, "Why are you gonna come out with that? That's the size that doesn't sell." And I says, "Well, you know what? If we go by the sizes, we're gonna sell. You know, we're just gonna be doing what everybody's doing." And and you know, the funny thing is, when M and I looked at our numbers uh, last year, the Corona Gorda for Senoria was the one that uh, sold the most, and so far for the uh, for the uh, Senoria Maduro Natural, the one that has sold the most has been the uh, the Longsdale. The uh, Longsdale is going to have by 44. But I have to be honest on that. That's not a size that sells a lot. What happens is that we have a lot of people that follow us on social media, and the majority of people that are on social media are like the Garnet, and they're more towards Coronas, Petit Coronas, Lanceros, Robustos, and they're not really into those big sizes. So. Uh, you take like the uh, Corona Gorda. You take like the Corona Larga that the, 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 the M is made for Freya. That cigar is selling phenomenal. It's not a size that you you're gonna see all the time, but it has a big following. It's like the pyramid. I mean, we're surprised. And overall, I mean the uh, the, the the pyramid. But Freya, all the sizes, the Toro. I mean the uh, the Robusto. I mean it's it's. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah, they're all traditional sizes. They're great phrases. Have you smoked that one, June? Um, no, I uh, I, gotta get you I got such a backlog without that idea to smoke, dude. Because I've been, uh, I don't, I unfortunately I don't smoke as much as I like to because of this new job. But where uh, do you work? Oh, uh, I'm in. Uh, so I live in Northern California in the Bay Area, and uh -huh. I live in. Uh, uh, so so I work in the Bay Area. 
Uh, so I work in Oakland, and uh, I'm a corporate finance guy, and it's a lot of it's, it's a lot of desk number stuff. He's got a good plant but, there. He's got a good plant there with him. Yeah, but and that's a whole other thing. Being in California, it sucks to be a cigar lover. Like everything is against us. <laughs> so it is what it is. So. <laughs> yeah. You gotta you gotta uh, you gotta hook up. Uh, uh, Seth, you gotta hook up uh, June with some uh, some freyas for him to try. Oh, I know. Yeah, I got him some freyas in the uh, Maduro, the Lonsdale. I love right. that smoke. That's a really good smoke. That's a good. That's a good Maduro offering, June. Smoke that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, bring up a uh, a country that's not big as a. Uh, let's say, a uh, big consumer of cigars is Sweden. And uh, we have a great distributor there, uh, Carl Martin. He has, in three years, revolutionized uh, tobacco uh, sales in, in Sweden. And it's, he has really what we call kicked ass. And one of the things that we've noticed, especially with Freya in uh, which is in a country where a lot of people smoke majority of Cuban cigars, how the impact of Freya has been even more than Senorial and Senorial Maduro. And what a lot of Swedes say is it has that Cubanist taste to it, notes to it. And the Swedish people that are very, very picky, we have been surprised how the bloggers there and all these people that are that are on social media have identified so much with it. It's that Viking theme too, man. The Viking theme. No, that was a good idea. That oh, yeah. let's not get those Vikings up and going. They're going to start raiding and pillaging our villages again. <laughs> that was, you know, June. The original idea for the Freya release was for me to walk around the IPCPR trade show dressed as a Viking. <laughs> <laughs> About you're a, I don't, I don't about think you make the height requirement, dude. You're, 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 are you a tall dude? Yeah, I'm like 6'4", man. I make the height requirement. I'm oh, are you? You're 6'4"? Yeah. Oh, shit. I'm I didn't know guy. that. I can make the Viking oh. requirement. I'm growing the beard for it, too. Oh. <laughs> you just wait. <laughs> Is that Emma in the background? I didn't hear Tell Emma we said hello. I hear. Yeah, Emma. They say hello. They hear you. Uh, where uh, Where are you, Jose? Are you in the states right now, or are you oh, in uh, Central America? Dominican Republic. Oh, nice. Jose is an international man of mystery. He's always someplace. Nice. <laughs> I see your uh, Instagram pictures of all these really scenic, like natural, lush areas and all that. Is that Dominican Republic where you're at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Cool. I I could do that too. I just need to take photos in front of my computer screen. That's what I'm <laughs> going to start doing. Pictures in front of the pyramids and everything. <laughs> what are you well, smoking, Seth? Uh, I'm just finishing this Gigantes where the wrapper was cracked and, and broken and you know, just top quality construction. No, I, I dropped it, so I was like, oh, might as well smoke it. But it smoked nice. Yeah. So. Even though the bands are a little too fancy, I think I think uh, Cuba's got to continue making like the new Por Laranaga band. They got to keep making those crappy old bands. That's what makes the quality, I think, with some of their so talking, flashy now. Their lower talking brands about, are so flashy. Talking about uh, it was the uh, what was it? Was it the Monte Cristo Maduro that came out now? Oh, the Partagas Maduro, yeah. Maduro, how was that? Better than Cohiba Maduro, but it's really one of those. I don't know. I don't. I don't get why they would do it. It's, yeah, I mean, you have the Partagas brand, then you make this Partagas Maduro. It's, I, I don't get it. I think it's stupid. I think they should just kind of stick to what they're doing, or what they were doing. So, they just don't do Maduros. Cubans can't do Maduros. You know, people just, some people just can't do stuff like that. It's, uh, yeah, well, you know, they, they're. Well, at least the go I haven't smoked it yet. I've I've seen I've heard mixed reviews on it. Some people like it, some people did you smoke it, June? Uh which one? The Partagas Maduro, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. 
Um, no, I, I don't want to. <laughs> I, have, I, I have no incentive to buy that thing. I mean, if there's any indication of the Kohiba one, no things. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, allocate money to something else. So, I'm very, like, when I, I realized that, uh, uh, you know what I've been really digging is uh, the Agonorsa stuff. Like, I, I really dig how rich and flavorful that stuff is um, for the non cuba stuff. And with Cuba stuff, it's just, you know, I'll smoke it. I'll just kind of, sometimes I just close my eyes and I just go pick something. So, yeah. I wish I had more of those 100 anos, Jose. You let me know if you have more somewhere stashed in the basement. Nice. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm, but that was a. That was I, mean. I, I, was might have, I might have. I don't know. Maybe six or seven left. Nice. Uh, the Corona size. I smoked my last Bellicoso about maybe six months ago. The one that got the big uh, 93 rating on it. That was back in 04, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah, that's the. Yeah. I have some of those 04 Bellicosos. You have some of. They're not going anywhere. I'm not smoking them. You know, it's funny. Uh, the The great thing about that is, you know, some cigars, they tend to lose strength and flavor with time, even though it's lost a little bit of uh, strength on them. But that creaminess, uh, that that flavor, the balance, this, that nice spice, they're all great smoke. I mean, it's still there. It's a cigar that ages very well. There's cigars, some cigars that age well, and some cigars that don't age well, but that cigar ages very, very, very well. Do you have presents? Uh, sorry, do you have presents in Asia, Jose, for your cigars? We're working on that. We've been working on that. Uh, I've been going to Hong Kong and uh, and Shanghai a lot. I have a uh, oh, okay, and uh, there, uh, but it's not as easy because you know you hear a lot of people say, well, we sell in in China, well. Only actually two companies that sell legal in, in there that it's severely uh, Davidoff and the Cubans. Then what happens is that a lot of stuff goes through Macau, Singapore, Hong Kong, things like that. And sometimes the monopoly just looks the other way depending who has it. Uh, but uh, it's hard to get in there. Yeah, because I was going to say a lot of the Asian countries are starting to really have a newfound appreciation for cigars. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, with the you know, with the money that they just spent getting recently, uh, you know, you just wake up, you're like, oh, I have oil oil in my backyard and get all that money from the government. I mean, they they spend. And one of the things that I met, because uh, my brother-in-law and my sister, they're in Hong Kong. So uh, when I went to see his friends, they were all asking me about cigars and, you know, how to get this and how to get that, and which is kind of interesting because I'm over here going, Wait a minute. Why are you asking me about Cuban cigars? You're you're in a country where you can get them. I'm in the U.S. <laughs> so it's not easy. But I did see a lot of uh, a lot of different brands, especially in uh, Hong Kong. The Sheraton has a very nice, very nice lounge. I would say maybe for you could sit down probably 40, 45 people. Oh wow. They had uh, they had Davidoff there. They had Oliva. They had Padron. They had Fuente. Uh, I saw three or four or five non-Cuban brands there. Hmm. Nice. Going yeah. places. Well, that was our hour. That's what a Margo. Jose. Thank you for being our guest. No, it's always a pleasure to be with uh, two young talented. Uh, brothers of the leaf and uh, open-minded because what I like more is to talk with people that are open-minded and uh, get uh, different reactions and uh, different uh, feedback of, uh, of what they like they don't like and it's like I said you know uh, the best cigar in the world is the one that uh, you enjoy the most and a free one uh, that said, free <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, people always love a free cigar. And uh, the thing is that you have to be open-minded. You have to smoke different cigars, different sizes, different profiles. Even if you love one country, you have to smoke different countries because the profile from uh, from that country is going to be more or less similar on everything. So if you really want to develop your palate and uh, really uh, open up to new experiences, uh, you have to really uh, 
smoke different things. Yeah, agreed. Sure. Or else you're missing out. You, I mean, guys that smoke like just Nick Robinson cigars, what, four or five years ago? Nika is nothing like that nowadays, in my opinion. So you're really missing out if you don't smoke the whole gamut of stuff. Got to get around. Yep. Anyways. Well, well, thank you, everyone. Everyone have a good Monday evening and the rest of your week. And a wonderful Thanksgiving. We'll see you all December. Yes. I hope to uh, be invited again to the uh, the program. What an embargo. Oh, you're always invited. Just tell us if you ever want to pop on in and yeah. give, us some, give us some crap. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. Okay.